Well, good morning, everybody. And, and those of you who are joining us online, thanks for being a part of today's service. Wherever you're watching from or whatever time of day or week it, or time of the week it is, we're, we're glad you joined us. I know a lot of people uh, can't join us on Sunday morning, but throughout the week they're able to watch the services. So we really value your participation and being a part of what, what's happening here today. And, and we don't believe that there's any distance in the spirit that whether you're here or there, God can still speak uh, to you today, and we're very grateful. But just on a personal note, just being in here in this, in this room together, uh, just sitting over here while Beth was sharing the opening of the service, um, the cool thing about this building, which you might not realize, is that when we designed it uh, we, you know, with this slope like this and the lighting the way it is, we actually can see everybody. We can see from here, we can see those of you in the back row. I, can, I recognize you. I recognize who you are. And so just sitting here and seeing friendly faces uh, and just seeing you in church just endears our heart. We're so grateful that you came. And, and for those of you who are watching or aren't quite ready to come back, uh, we're here. Whenever you're ready, we're going to be here. And so we'd love for you to join us when you're, when you're comfortable. But it's just so great to, to see all y'all. And I just never want to lose the, the awe that there is in just being able to share a message that we believe God put in our hearts to share with you. And, you know, we can't change your life, but he can. And so, you know, what, what we, you know, we do our part, but we can't do his part. You know, he's the one who brings the spirit of wisdom and revelation into our lives. And so as we are preparing today's message, I just had you in mind and with the thought of, you know, just hoping or really trusting and by faith believing that, that God will use the things that we say today and the whole service to really make a connection with you that really helps your faith, really encourages you. So thanks again for being here with us and for joining us uh, online. We look forward to just sharing a, a brief message that I hope will really touch your heart. <clears throat> Chances are that if you're really honest, and can we be honest in church? Yeah, let's be honest. If you're really honest, that maybe this last year has been a difficult time in a lot of ways, but also a difficult time spiritually. And that, that chances are that this one way you could describe a time like we've had where, where everything's sort of been in an upheaval, that everything that was our routine changed. And the idea that we had maybe a routine where we came to church every week and we had, you know, services that looked pretty much the same, not in a bad way, but there was a, an expectation of this is what would happen while we were there in church. Or, uh, and then, you know, of course, work changed and school changed. And, and, and it might even have altered how you would have what we would call a quiet time, a time where you devoted every day uh, to your relationship with the Lord and, and read your Bible or had a time of worship or whatever it might be, a time of prayer. That might have changed because of this, just the circumstances of life. And so you might say, to be honest, things are a little dry. Or, in fact, maybe things might be a, a little stale. And it's okay to admit it, but, but it's, it's also okay to say, listen, I want to do something about it. In fact, uh, it's not uncommon that people who get in a position where they feel this way, what they, they think the answer is, maybe I need to change churches. Maybe, maybe the dryness I'm experiencing, maybe the, the staleness in my relationship with the Lord really needs to be stirred up by attending a different church. And really that's not the answer. But what, what needs to happen is we need to learn to stir ourselves up. And so, you know, it's not uncommon even in marriage circles. You know, the people who have been married for things to get a little stale, a little dry, uh, that much romance. Of course, that's never happened with Beth and I. It's been red hot uh, <laughs> since the day we met and were married. Um, but for some of you, you might have experienced it, or people you know <laughs> might have experienced it. So what they do is they end up, instead of, instead of you know, devoting that passion to their spouse, they start looking elsewhere, thinking, well, maybe that person will bring the spark we used to have. Well, that's not, you know, really the, the answer either. In fact, a friend of ours, a dear friend from Co uh, Colorado Springs, he pastors the church there, Dean Hawk, just did a podcast I listened to last week. He called this phenomenon of right now, the currently in churches around America, there are a lot of people ch changing churches. Just there's a, there's a shift going on. He called it the COVID church shuffle. <laughs> I had to laugh. But he, just, he defined it exactly what's happening, this idea of I'm just looking for answers. I'm looking for something different. And so what I hope to share with you today will just encourage your heart and, and stir up something that's inside of you that will just renew that passion that you've had for the Lord, a passion that you have with him and that, you're, that your desire to see that grow and develop. And, and really we're going to find out that it all stems and is built 
around worship. And so we're calling today's message, There's a New Day Dawning. A New Day Dawning. So if you feel a little stale, you feel a little dry, I'm here to tell you, there's a new day day dawning. Now the fun part of this whole time together is we're going to look at a chapter in the Bible. In, in, in fact, it's, I'm going to give you a clue. It's in the New Testament. And it's fact, it's the last chapter of one of the four Gospels. And in this chapter, we're going to see that the, uh, the, a, a, uh, a plan for worship, a thread that passes through this whole chapter that really ties it all together and makes it really a chapter about worship. You'd never think of this chapter. You wouldn't go to this chapter and think, I want to learn about worship from, from here. And, and so, but, but we're going to learn uh, 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 really a, a fun journey through this. So go ahead and open your Bibles. You ready? Here's the chapter. Matthew chapter 28. So turn your Bible on, open it up, whatever you have, an electronic version or a paper version. I want you to follow this because here's what my goal is. Here's what my hope is. My hope is as we share the, 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 this passage with you and, and God teaches us and shows us some things, it will stir up a passion in you for, your, for the Bible. It will stir up a passion for you and, and I to realize that the Bible is God's primary way of communicating to us. He, he speaks to us through his word. He teaches us. He trains us. He develops us by our learning of Scripture. And so it's the essential element of, of our lives together. And really we're going to find out that in the, in the midst of this teaching today that worship is essential. And we're going to spend time looking at seven Ps. Here's, I'm going to give them to you real quick. And then we're going to walk through these seven together. Here it is. Here's the seven Ps we're going to find in this chapter. There's a plan, a place, a person, a process. It comes with a problem. But the result is there's power. And in the end, there's God's presence. And so that's what we're going to look at today as we, as we open up our Bibles. Before we do that, though, let me just share this quote with you because I thought it was really profound for what we're going to look at today. It comes from uh, 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 Reverend William Temple. He's the Bishop of Manchester. He said it this way about worship. He said, the world can be saved by one thing, and that is worship. For to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, to devote the, the will of God, or excuse me, to devote the will to the purpose of God. I love that. It just is a great reminder of the role that worship plays in terms of our passion for God. And so if you're ready, let's read Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, I want to underline that, that again is the message or the title of today's message. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to visit the tomb. Everything important to them had been crushed and taken away three days earlier, when they watched Jesus, the hope of the world, Jesus, the bread of life, Jesus, the miracle man, they watched him die on a cross. Everything stopped because the one that they'd placed all their hopes in was dead. He was no more. But the Spirit of God drew them to that gravesite that early that morning because when we think that all hope is lost, that our best days are behind us, God is always working behind the scenes. He always has better plans. And there's always a new day dawning. So I don't care if, if, if you're watching this this morning feeling that you're at your very end, or you've come in this morning with, a, with a, one of those desperate cries to God, God, are you real? God, can you help me? God, can you touch me? Here's what I'm telling you right now. There's a new day dawning for you. There's a freshness that God wants to have in your life with you that's very, very personal to you. It's his gift to you today. Verse 2. Suddenly there was a 
great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning. His clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was laying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. Now, I want you to underline or highlight this in your Bible. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and I Will see, or, and they will see me there. They did three things that I want you to see because this is very important for us. Number one, they ran to him. They saw Jesus and they ran to him. The reason we come to church is we love to be together. We love to be in church with our families. We love to be together with our church family, with our family of God. It's important to us. There's a great value to this. But we don't run to church for that reason. We run to church because we run to meet Jesus. That's why we're here. They ran to Jesus and they grabbed his feet. I love the picture that paints. Why would you grab someone's feet? You grab someone's feet because you don't want them to leave you. Do not leave me. Stay here with me. When we get ready to go somewhere, our little dog Jonesy, you know, our little three-pounder, she's, uh, she'll, 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 she'll know something's up, but she don't really know what happens, and she wants to be with us, and so she's not big enough to grab our feet, so she'll, she'll bump my legs, she'll, she'll grab, boom, 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 and if she could hold on to me, she would. Why is that? Because she wants to be where I am. That's the way we should be with Jesus. We should run to him. We should grab his feet and what? Worship him. You see, the way to keep our passions for God red hot is by running to him, by grabbing his feet, by worshiping to him. And we're going to find out in this very chapter that that's God's plan all along. It's always been God's plan for us to have a deeply passionate and personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So you ready for the P's? Here they are. Number one, if we're going to run in 2021, we're gonna, if we're going to run into worship, then we need to apply these P's into our life. This first one, there is a plan for worship. We saw the setup here in verse 10. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee. But if you'll jump down to verse 16, then the 11 disciples left for Galilee. In other words, here's what we need to know. Without hesitation, they followed his instructions. It's just as true for us. If we want to keep our relationship with God for, uh, to be genuine, we, we, we want it to make sense, then we need to follow the instructions of the Lord and allow them to take full precedence and top priority in our lives. In other words, we become followers of God's word. We walk by faith, not by sight. It is our hallmark. It's what separates from us from the world. We don't look for our, for our instructions for life on 24-hour news. We turn to God's word as our source of life, we're, which means either we're nuts or we're people of faith. So look around the room and decide what we are. We're people of faith. 
So Jesus' instructions were to get away from what's been distracting to you. He said, I need your undivided attention. Don't bring your cell phones. There won't be any Wi-Fi, no Facebook, no Instagram, no 24-hour news feed. I just need you looking to me. I want a face-to-face with, with you. When we were in Bible school, there was a particular a gal there in school that if uh, you ever t- saw her in a, somewhere, if, if she was standing uh, with you, like for instance, if I'm going to be her, and let's say I'm standing in front of her, so she's looking at me. When, when, she's, when you're talking to her, and you're, we're having a conversation, but here's what she's doing. She's doing this. The whole time. I mean, every time I ever talk to her, this is what she'd do. What, what is she saying when she's doing that? She's saying, I hope to God there's somebody in this room more interesting than you. <laughs> right? Or, or more popular than you, or could elevate my status than you. But I'm happy to talk to you because I'd rather just talk to somebody. But, you know, if anybody else comes along, I'm gone. Well, that's somehow, sometimes I think people's relationship with the Lord, it's kind of like that. Till something distracts me, I'm with you, Jesus, until something better com- comes along. And until something quick ca- catches my attention, that's where it's important for us if we're going to stay passionate. If we're not going to allow ourselves to, to get dry, we're going to always need to make sure that we keep our focus and attention on the Lord. See, the same thing can happen here at church. You come together with your family and your friends. That's really part of what, what, what being in church is. But again, it's not our main focus. Our focus is that this is a place that you and I can come to where we have a face-to-face encounter with Jesus. Why was this the first thing that Jesus told his disciples? Get away. Go to Galilee. So they could focus on him because he's the focal point of our worship. And and we need to be completely and madly in love with him for who he is. You see, Jesus knew even back then that it was human nature to be distracted from the main thing. He knew it would be important to purposely set aside time to worship, to keep our eyes on the prize, to to looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So that's why there's always been a plan for worship. And now let's keep reading because we're going to find out that there's also a place of worship. Look at verse 16. Then the disciples, they left for Galilee. That was the plan. Going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So just as important, we realize that there's a plan. There's also a need to find a designated place to meet God f- through worship, our, our own sort of anointed place of worship. It doesn't really matter where that place is. Your place might be different than our place. Now, we come here together and worship, but this is, should be only a portion of our worship life. Worship shouldn't just start and end here on a Sunday morning, either 9 or 10 a.m. Worship is who we are. We're we're worshipers of Jesus. The Spirit of God says he's looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. That's us. Wherever we are, we always have an opportunity to put our focus and our worship upon him. But we need to find our place uh, that we spend time with God. When I first got saved years ago, I, I didn't get saved in church, I, I, but I, I was definitely saved. I definitely had committed my life to Jesus, and I would, uh, would spend my times of worship, my time of, of learning and growing in faith in my car. I was a salesman traveling throughout West Michigan, so days on end, I'm literally every day in my car traveling to a different city to call on customers, and so between those sales calls, I would listen to uh, teaching of, of the Bible and listen to the word being taught. And, this, the, you know, Jesus said, my words, their spirit and their life. I would spend my, my days just being filled with God's word, just filled with his spirit, filled with life. It was just so remarkable, this revelation that would come of, of the truth of God's word. And then I'd listen to worship music, to songs about Jesus. And, and uh, it was just so rich, so so satisfying. It was like heaven on earth in my, my car. I'll, I'll never forget it, and I'm, I'm so thankful for, for it. 
So maybe for you it's a specific time of day where you, where you set aside to spend time with God, to, to just focus on him. It, it's a, maybe a time or a place, a room, or, or whatever you do. But find something for you. Because God, even though we have a corporate relationship with him, in other words, collectively as his church, it's, it's so personal, it's so individual, it's so important that we have a time where we spend with him. So there's a plan, and there's a place, and now we need to talk about the person of worship. Keep reading with me, verse 17. When they saw him. When they saw him. To become a worshiper, it's essential that we see Jesus for who he really is. Actually, I think what's essential even before that is that you and I see us for who we are. Because I think, number one, the most important revelation that we can have is that we're sinners in need of a Savior. In other words, we're a mess. And I don't, again, I don't know about you. I only know about my own life. But for me, I was able to identify I've messed up my life. I'm a mess. I need help, and I can't figure life out by myself. I have just too many things that are broken, and I'm, and I'm just in desperate need of help. That's the identifying the, the, the fact that I'm a sinner, and now I need a Savior. And when I found out who that was, I found out from someone sharing with me their faith in Jesus Christ and what it meant to them, it was easy for me then to open up my heart to him. I see when, when, when we able to see ourselves, then we're able to see him for who he really is. Here they are, they've, they've come to where Mary's told them to go, so put yourself in the disciples' shoes. Can you imagine the flood of emotions that must have hit them right across the side of the head when they, when they saw and they recognized Jesus, the one they thought was dead, who was gone forever, now he's walking toward them. Here he was again, Emmanuel, God with them, the son of man, the son of God, their, their teacher, their rabbi, their faithful friend, but he, and he was the same, but he was different. There was something different about him. There was something very different about him than he was three days earlier when he was on Calvary's cross. There was something different about him. This one who'd healed the sick, who'd cast out demons, who'd raised the dead, who walked on water, and the one who calmed the storm. He was there in front of them, walking up to them, but, but there was something different because this was the victorious Jesus. This was the one who'd conquered death hell and the grave. This was the one who held the keys of life. This is the one who was standing before them. He was now their redeemer, their savior. He was the all-forgiving, all-loving, ever-faithful king of kings and lord of lords. This is a different Jesus. They saw him differently because they recognized him through a different set of eyes. The eyes of their heart with a revelation knowledge of who he really is. I remember, as I say, as a, a young Christian, just growing in my faith, listening to, to different people on the radio. I was driving home from uh, some calls, sale calls in Holland. And I was driving back to Lansing. Driving through Grand Rapids, I was on I-196, the bypass through Grand Rapids, listening to Charles Swindoll. You ever hear that name? Chuck Swindoll from Texas. He was on the radio for a lot of years. I think he's still alive. He was teaching about the Trinity. Now, I didn't know much about the Trinity. I'd heard about it, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I heard the triune God, all those things. I didn't understand it much. And, and, uh, and I, I, I knew Jesus as the Son of God. In other words... You know, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I believed in Jesus as the son of God. But that day, he was teaching about Jesus being God, being equal with the father. That there was the father who was equal to the son and the spirit who was equal to the son and the father and the three were three persons in one. And, and when that revelation that this one I had called my Savior, 
this Jesus, this Son of God, was, was God himself. That, that God himself, the creator of the universe, he loved me enough to forgive me of the mess I'd made of life and love me enough to die for me 2,000 years ago to, to bring life and to bring hope and direction and, and, and meaning to, to life. When I realized that that was God, I had to pull the car over. On the highway. So I got off on the Beltline exit. Now, the Beltline exit nowadays is a little bit different. That's near Cornerstone University, if you're familiar with that area. So I went up the, up the exit, across the Beltline, down to, to the entrance ramp of the highway, and pulled over. Because I had to have a moment. We had to have some church. I wasn't even going to church. I didn't know what having church meant. But I know this. I needed to talk to God about this. Because if Jesus was God, then I need to make sure I'm saved. And I was like, God, I'm sorry if I, if I didn't think you were who you said you were, but I, I apparently know who you are now, and I am so thankful. And I had this time of grabbing onto his, first of all, running to him, grabbing his feet, and just worshiping him. I don't know how long I spent on that little side of the, of the entrance ramp, but long enough to get what was in here connected to Jesus. Amen. You see, we need those times. We need those moments where it's real to us because it, these are life-altering, life-shaping things that change the pattern of the, and the pace and the purpose of the rest of your life. We, we need it. It's so important. You see, to worship Jesus, he's got to be more than just a good man. He's got to be more than just a miracle worker. We need to see him as the Christ, the son of the living God, the one and only person who was 100% God, 100% man who gave his life for us. So there's a a plan for worship. There's a place for worship. There's a person for worship. Now let's look at the process of worship. Look at verse 17. When they saw him, when they saw him, the result was they worshiped him. See, what happens when we really see Jesus for who he is? We worship. Throughout the ages, when a person encounters the living God, the immediate result is they worship, like fall down on their face, worship, worship. Abraham encountered God after a battle, and he paid tithes, and he worshiped God. Jacob wrestled with God one night and worshiped and called the place Bethel. Moses fell down and worshiped God at the burning bush. Joshua, when he was leading the children of Israel into battle, he encountered the captain of the Lord's army. He took off his shoes for the place he stood was holy, and he fell down and he worshiped God. Isaiah saw the Lord and he worshiped and confessed. Elijah witnessed the fire of God come down on the altars, and he worshiped and then defeated the prophets of Baal. We just read it earlier this this morning when Mary and the others were coming back from the empty tomb. When they saw Jesus, they fell down, they grabbed his feet, and they worshiped. When we truly have the spiritual discernment to see Jesus for who he is, we'll want to show him our appreciation and our love. You see, worship is simply the manifestation of the depth of our personal relationship for us. There's a there's, there's something that has to happen in us. There's something that has to be exchanged. A, a love and appreciation needs to come from us. No one else can do it for us. The worship team can't worship for us. No one can love God for us. That has to come from us. Let me explain. Are, are you for, are familiar with the song, uh, My Redeemer Lives? It's an old song. It's written by Nicole C. Mullins. It's a, it's a great song. I remember the first time I, I heard it. It was a number of years. It's probably a 15, 20-year-old song. But the first time I heard it, I was listening to the radio. And uh, I was driving into church on a Sunday morning. I, I would always go in very, very early. It was hours early before anybody got there. I was the first person for years to open the building. I'd come in the building and I would pray and I would 
read and the, my Bible and worship. And so I was on my way to do that. And this song I'd never heard came on the radio. And just as the music began, there's something just gripped my heart. There was an anointing on the song, a power in, these, in, the, in this song. And I, I listened to it. And it went like this. Who taught the sun where to stand in the morning? And who told the ocean you can only come this far? And who showed the moon where to hide till evening? Whose words alone can catch a falling star? Well, I know my Redeemer lives. All of creation testifies. This life within me cries, I know my Redeemer lives. The very same God that spins things in orbits, runs to the weary, the worn, and the weak, and the same gentle hands that hold me when I'm broken, they conquer death to bring me victory. For I know my Redeemer lives. Let all creation testify. Let this life within me cry. I know my Redeemer lives. And he lives to take away my shame. And he lives forever, I'll proclaim, that the payment for my sin was the precious life he gave. But now he's alive and there's an empty grave and I know my Redeemer lives. Come on, somebody. I know my Redeemer lives. Where's the power in that song? There's no power in that song until you put yourself in the middle of the song. If that's just a song, if those are just words, it's meaningless. There's nothing there. But when Jesus becomes your redeemer for your sins, the only hope you have, man, I tell you what, you want to proclaim, I know my redeemer lives. I sat in that parking lot all by myself, and I cried, and I cried out to God, and I thanked him and worshiped him. I don't know what happened in church that morning. I wish I could tell you that, you know, revival broke out that day. But you know what? I had church that morning in my little family van that day. And I'll never forget that church service because that's what God wants for me and that's what God wants for you. So he wants those moments where it's real. There's a connection and it, it changes how you, how you live your life. We looked at the plan. We looked at the place, the person, the process. But like most things in life, there can also be a problem. Look at verse 17. They saw him. They worshiped him. But notice this. But some of them, what's that word? Doubted. What? They doubted. You say, well, who was there? Who, who, who was there? Well, this was the disciples. This was the 11. Remember, Judas had, had hung himself, so these are the 11. Peter, James, and John, the other eight. This is not some group of the curious. It's, it's not even the crowd. It's the committed. And, and of them, right in the middle of this celebration, spontaneous worship, there were some that doubted. See, what were they doubting? Were they doubting whether or not this was Jesus? Were they Doubting the sincerity of the worshipers? You ever done that? You come to church and there's somebody you know in church that you know from work who at work they're just a complete jerk. And they're just mean and nasty and they come to church and they're like, you know, the worship music starts and they're like, oh, Jesus, we love you, Lord. And you think, my goodness, what a phony, right? Just you live in like hell during the week and act like heaven on the weekends. What's up with that? Some doubt it. Is that too honest? <laughs> Y'all got quiet. Let us pray. <laughs> but what was Jesus' response? He gave room for them. Because it's like he's, he's the real deal. He, his, his arms are wide open. He's saying, listen, if you've got questions or whatever, don't, don't, don't not come in. Get, get involved. Get, get closer. The, the closer you get, the more real this becomes. The more real this becomes, the more life-changing it can happen to you. You've got to start somewhere. But come on. 
That's the way we should be as a church too, right? We should have open arms to people who, who may, this may all be new to them. There's a plan, there's a place, a process, a person, there's even a problem, which brings us to the last two, and I'll, I'll close with these. There's a power. Look at verse 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority or power in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The result of following the plan is to experience ultimately the power of the grace of God in a way that really does change how we live our lives. I don't know about you, but I've tried to live life in my own power then, or, or living by God's power, and God's power is always better than my power. Remember, this is a different Jesus. This was diff he was different since the resurrection because now he declares that he has all power, all authority, all power in heaven and on earth at his disposal. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful at all times. There's no power greater than his. And listen, he then offers to share that power with his disciples and ultimately with us. He said, you take this power and you do something with it. To be honest with you, I think it's the Christian's greatest secret weapon for life, being able to plug into the power of God through worship. If you're here today and you're struggling with, with, with issues, with, with conflicts, with hurts, with pains, with sicknesses, with lack, you, you, you name it, confusion, whatever it might be, you can get your focus on Jesus and if you'll, if you'll run to him, you'll, you'll grab his feet and, and, and you'll worship him. I'll tell you what, that's where the power of God comes to heal a hurting heart. That's where the healing power that comes to, to heal the, 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 the sickness that might come upon you. That's where wisdom comes when we're seeking answers is not to run from God but to run to him and to plug into his power through worship. Come on somebody, say amen to that. So if you ever come up to a brick wall and you really need to get to the other side, then it's probably a great time to crank up the music. When Beth and I have faced challenges in the past in leading the church, I'll never forget that time we drove around this parking lot when the, the bank pulled out from financing this project. We had millions of dollars of steel on its way from China, and we, were, uh, we, 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 we had earth movers working all over this property, and the bank pulled out. Fortunately, we had some money in the bank to cover some current expenses, but I'm thinking, how are all these earth movers going to get paid? What are we going to do? You know what Beth and I did? We just cried like little babies and gave up hope. No, we didn't. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you were still awake. What did we do? We cranked up the music. We drove the, tr the truck around the parking lot, and we just sang to the Lord because this is his power. This is his church. He's going to get us through to the other side. There's something about worshiping God. There's a plan. There's a place, a person, a process, a problem. There's power. But in the end, now this is the greatest reward. You ready for this? His presence. Notice this. I tell you what, you're going to never see chapter 28 of Matthew the same, but it ends with this. Jesus said, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What's he saying? If you'll follow the plan, you'll follow the process, you'll get to this place where you're going to experience my presence. You ever feel like God is far away? That feeling really is a symptom of what what we would call a starting of your heart to get hard. There's no better way to keep your heart soft and pliable in God's hands than it is through worship. Because worship is our pathway to the presence of God. Psalm 16.8 says, I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken. He is right beside me. Verse 11, same chapter says, you will show me the way of life granting me the joy of your presence. One translation says, in your presence is fullness of joy and the pleasures of living with you forever. It's awesome to come to church so that we can be with each other, but we're missing it if we don't have a real life encounter with Jesus Christ, the focus of our entire time together. Worship is the thread that should be running through our entire relationship 
with Jesus because ultimately it leads us into his presence. So what do we do with all of this? Well, it's simple. Find some playlists that work for you. You know, there's a lot of different music sources you can go to. You don't have to find it yourself. Just, just like I know what I do. I go to Spotify and I'll just plug in the word worship. And people put together amazing playlists that you can listen to. I listen to them all the time. Why? To always keep my heart soft for the Lord. Spend time every day allowing your heart to be touched through worship. worship and just see how that passion just starts to just rise up within you and become more real and real. So how about this? Will you run with us in 2021? Will you run with us into worship? Because I believe for all of us, there is a new day dawning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. And may I pray for those that do not know your son Jesus, that today is a day that they would invite him into their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Before uh, Beth comes and the worship team comes to lead us into a little worship, let me just ask you this, for those of you who are here, those of you who are watching online, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, it's super important. This is the, the starting gate. Jesus said it this way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So our access to everything we've talked about today, the presence of God in our life, comes from accepting Jesus for who he is, our Savior which means we have to identify with the fact that we're sinners in need of a Savior. So I want to invite you to join me in a very simple prayer that just surrenders our life to God, allowing Jesus Christ to be the Lord of our life and receive this gift of forgiveness and salvation and really eternal life with Him. Would you say these words with me from your heart? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you're God's Son and you died for my sins. And I confess I'm a sinner I need a Savior. So Jesus, be the Lord of my life from this day forward. Amen. Amen. Well, congratulations. That's, let's give him a hand. That's a big prayer to pray. That's a big, big change of life right there.